mode. Good morning, everyone. This is Brad Adams. Uh, I'm going to be your moderator today. Um, I am the chair uh, of the website committee for Tennessee HFMA. Um, and so one of those things I usually get to do is help out and kind of host these. Um, so just a couple of quick housekeeping items um, and announcements. Uh, to start off the day. Um, if you want a copy of the slide deck, we've already posted that out um, to the website, so the same page um, that you went to yesterday or, or whenever you registered to get more information, it's there. Uh, there should be a link to it in the chat window that you should all be able to see as well. Um, and then after the end of this webinar, um, probably by Monday for sure, um, we'll have a recording of this posted as well to the website through YouTube. Um, so that way, if you found something in here particularly useful and you want to be able to share it with your colleagues, um, please feel free to do so. That's that's why we do this. We try and, you know, keep things as, as open and as we can. Um, so throughout today's webinar, if you've got any questions, you can type those into the question box. Um, we're also going to have a period at the end or whenever else our speakers want to where we can actually um, unmute your audio and take questions. Um, so you also see there's a little ability to raise your hand. Um, so when we get to that point, um, if you want to, to ask a question um, and your audio is hooked up either through the phone or you've got a mic on your computer, uh, feel free to do that and we can, can answer questions that way. Um, one other thing that we're working on that I kind of wanted to let everybody know is, you know, you're going to notice we're going to start having polling questions throughout these webinars as we go forward. And we're doing that because that's one of the requirements um, for NASBA so that we can start actually off issuing uh, CPE certificates um, for all of our CPA members. Um, and so we've got to kind of prove that, that what we've got set up works to meet their requirements. Um, and kind of have a track record before we can submit um, to get approved for that. So that's kind of one of the things we're doing. So definitely make sure when, when we mention that there's a polling question up that you go ahead and answer that. Um, we'll leave them up for about a minute or so. Um, so that's kind of all I've got. So let me go ahead. I get to introduce our speakers today. Um, our first speaker is Chris Fox. He is the Chief Executive Officer for Vantis. Um, and so they are really focused in on helping uh, facilities optimize uh, their staffing. Um, so Chris has got a bachelor's degree in broadcast journalism from University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, he's also a member of the American College of Healthcare Executives, uh, of the HFMA, um, and of the American Organization of Nurse Executives. Um, our second speaker today is Logan Pig. Uh, many of you that are in the chapter know Logan. He's spoken at some of our chapter events before and, and helps out and volunteers with the chapter. Uh, Logan is the Corporate Director of Finance for Mountain State's Health Alliance over in Johnson City, uh, Tennessee. Um, and Logan has got both bachelor's and master's in business uh, from East Tennessee State University. And he is a certified healthcare uh, management professional, so CHFP um, of the HFMA. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to, to these gentlemen and let them uh, get started. And so, like I said, if you've got any questions, something's not working right, um, submit a question or post something in the chat, and I'm going to keep an eye on those um, throughout to try and help anybody who's having any technical issues as well. Gentlemen? Thanks, Brad. This is Chris. Appreciate the opportunity to visit with all of you. I'm, I'm going to be the warm-up act today, and Logan gets to be uh, the star of the show. Um, this might seem, as a starting point, um, obvious to most of you, but others also might be asking, why is optimizing your people resources important in today's healthcare environment? Well, I, I kind of reference it as the third leg of the financial stool. Most provider organizations have already uh, are in the process of redesigning processes, adding automation, or finding strategic partners to help with the other two legs of the financial stool, supply chain and revenue cycle management. Uh, but what we found is that it's equally important for our client organizations to better manage their largest cost center, which is labor. And I think we're finding that there's going to be a similar level of attention in healthcare uh, as it relates to labor, as it does to those other two legs of the financial stool. Uh, there's two, as you see on the slide, big market trends in healthcare that support that need to focus on labor as a strategic initiative. The first is market consolidation. Uh, I think you're finding a lot of organizations that are acquiring other hospitals or uh, hospitals that are 
requiring medical group practices uh, within the structure or the uh, initiative of a consolidation, efficiencies are key to the success uh, and the integration of those groups. And consistent staffing and scheduling practices, as well as consistent labor targets, are important to those uh, consolidation initiatives. That second trend is the focus on savings. As, as all of you are well aware, you're never going to get paid more for your services than you are now. Uh, and so there's this downward trend on the reimbursement side and on the revenue side. So there's a need to move to a cost mindset and do better with less. There's just no, no getting around that. So we just believe that both of those trends certainly support the need to focus uh, on labor as a strategic initiative. And with that, Brad, I'm just thinking this might be a good time to pause for the initial polling question. All right, yep, sure thing. So, so everybody should be able to see the uh, polling question up on their screen now. So, um, you know, do you anticipate merging or has your organization recently merged um, with another health system? So, um, and I added an NA on there because I know a lot of our attendees don't necessarily uh, work um, in a provider organization. Um, but we'll give that just another about 30 seconds or so. So if everybody can uh, get their answer in. Um, that's going to help out. Let's see. So I know this is something, you know, I'm, for those of you guys who don't know me, I work at Vanderbilt. So I know this is something that's been going on with us with a new uh, strategic alliance. And one of those alliance partners is actually uh, Mountain State. It's where Logan's at. So. All right. So we've got most of the people have voted. So let's go ahead and take a look here. So about a third of the folks have uh, have already done this or in the process. About half haven't, and another chunk, they're not on the provider side of the world, so they haven't uh, haven't had to deal with that within their own organization yet. Well, that's helpful to know. I appreciate the the feedback from everyone. There there is a methodology for the general labor integration. Um, that will help those of you who have either consolidated or have plans to do that in the future. And if we can move through the next few slides, um, we'll talk a little bit or introduce HELM. Uh, HELM stands for Healthcare Enterprise Labor Management. It's a comprehensive approach, uh, which includes workforce planning, uh, demand forecasting, operational best practices, and then scheduling and staffing automation, as well as financial reporting. Um, you can capture a lot of low-hanging fruit with any one of these steps as it relate, relates to labor savings. Um, true sustainability over time, though, comes from the more comprehensive approach. Uh, when we talk about HELM, enterprise is really the key word. It's that consistency in policies and practices across the enterprise. So whether it be multiple units, multiple facilities, multiple service lines, uh, uh, you know, multiple cost centers, it's that consistency in how you manage labor. And uh, enterprise also means it's not just for nursing. It's across all departments that have a variable staffing model or have the opportunity to move to a variable staffing model based upon, you know, fluctuating uh, volumes or activity. And it's the ability to share resources and to flex according to those volumes. That's really what what Helm is all about. You can see from both the red and the green boxes that there are predictable results, uh, increased employee morale, quality of care, just through the coordination of the right resource to the right place at the right time, as well as decreased labor costs and turnover. And I know Logan will talk more about what those have looked like uh, within the Mountain States organization. But once again, just want to reiterate, this is not simply about technology or it's not a problem that should be solved by just software. It's equally dependent on the right plan and also adjusting the culture of each organization. So with that, let's go ahead and talk about an organization in Tennessee, Mountain States, who's perfected that plan. Uh, Brad already introduced Logan, uh, Corporate Director of Finance for Mountain States. I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with Mountain States as an organization. Their flagship 
uh, Hospital, Johnson City Medical Center is Tennessee's first magnet designated hospital. And Mount States as a system is the winner of the National Quality Forum's National Quality Healthcare Award uh, in 2012. Avantis has been a proud partner with Mount States for more than five years. Uh, with that, I'll turn things over to Logan. Thank you, Chris. Um, like you said, Mountain States has been uh, working towards uh, a more enterprise approach towards staffing away from the traditional siloed approach for a number of years. Um, and with you know, with that, we've come a long way uh, with Advantis and uh, working towards that model. So, back before Mountain States uh, started their partnership with Advantis, we were facing some huge uh, operational hurdles: uh, national nursing shortage expensive uh, incentive programs, countless operational silos, and simply an inability to coordinate uh, available resources. Um, this was leading our flagship facility, uh, Johnson City Medical Center in Johnson City, Tennessee, um, to run with an exorbitant amount of uh, external contract labor. Uh, in fact, the amount of contract labor in some years was exceeding $12 million, with an average uh, hourly rates in the $60 to $90 an hour range. Not to mention uh, core staffing incentives with our own folks um, were not very well managed and somewhat out of control at times. And uh, all this was happening at our flagship facility while a lot of our other facilities in our system were sending folks home on low census or uh, you know over the weekend when sometimes those uh, censuses drop. So adding to all those uh, staffing issues I just mentioned uh, was the fact that we were struggling to try to measure and impact any significant change. Uh, finance and nurse managers were not speaking the same language. Finance only had lagging information on productivity and uh, very high level salary analysis information coming from our financial reporting systems. By the time finance uh, closed the books for the month and began reviewing, uh, leadership was having conversations with nurses who were already looking ahead into next month's staffing. Um, so it was really hard to impact tomorrow uh, with yesterday's information. Uh, there was just too much lag time. Uh, to make any conversation really meaningful. Uh, to make matters worse, the nurse managers themselves were struggling uh, with having any tools to manage uh, anything uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So team members were clocking in the wrong departments, working the wrong shifts. Um, nobody could accurately manage the day-to-day -day changes. We needed to get more actionable, real-time data that our nursing staff and leadership could both understand. Uh, and we needed a way to try to impact the staffing needs without reverting to those uh, external staffing agencies to kind of help solve our problem. So I think, uh, you know, Brad, we might have had another polling question at this point. Yep, let me bring that up. Great, thanks. Okay, so do your finance or nursing departments collaborate on financial and strategic initiatives? Right. I'm going to leave this open for another another couple sec 30 seconds or so just to give everybody a chance to, to vote. But go ahead and share the results here um, because they're kind of overwhelming um, with 76 uh, percent of people responding yes, that they are um, having that collaboration on financial and strategic initiatives uh, between finance and nursing, 14 um, percent saying no, and then 10 percent, um, you know, this isn't applicable um, to them. Brad, this is Chris again. Well, that's interesting results. We've obviously got a good group of folks uh, on the phone today uh, that work well together, and that collaboration really is the basis uh, and provides a nice foundation for an opportunity to build a strategic labor plan. Um, for the remainder of our time today, uh, Logan and I are going to highlight uh, some key labor management strategies that can address some of those challenges that Logan dis discussed that were uh, prominent within the Mountain States environment and hopefully help to bridge that gap and or build upon that collaboration between finance and nursing. Um, focus on just a few of these strategies, as I said before, could produce um, some results and certainly a comprehensive approach like the one at Mountain States that uh, implements all of these strategies will produce very, very tangible results. 
which uh, Logan will talk about more down the road. But if, if we start to look at the actual steps, just like building a house, it's important to begin with the foundation. And that foundation, as it relates to a labor management plan, is having the right amount and types of resources available to your cost centers and to your organization. Uh, you must have a clear understanding of the makeup of your workforce and also analyze how effectively each area is utilizing those resources that they currently have. Um, you really need to consider things such as, one, the right amount of full and part-time staff that are hired to meet demand are those available to you. Uh, secondly, those resources need to be scheduled properly and balanced against the actual flow of demand on that unit. How good of a job are you doing with that? And then, and then lastly, whether or not individuals are being scheduled to their hired FTE or their uh, FTE commitment, meaning if I'm a point nine, I should be working 36 hours a week or 72 hours of pay period. Um, are, they, are they working to the level that they're being paid from a benefits perspective? The goal really overall of a workforce plan is to keep your core staff or your full and part-time FTEs working on the unit that they're hired to and also scheduling them to meet what we call census mode. That's the most frequent census point on the unit. And, and then also, secondly, to have enough flexible internal contingency resources, either your PRN per diem folks or your site or enterprise-wide float pool resources to then fill in for those times when your core staff take PTO, FMLA, or have meeting and education time. These might sound like really basic strategies, but most organizations that we talk to don't know where they stand as it relates to the amount and types of core and internal contingency resources. So we find that in most instances, their foundation of their house is already cracked uh, as it relates to putting together the pieces of the puzzle of a, of a labor plan. Simply by you know, taking an organization's HR and payroll data and analyzing it against the actual historical patient volumes and other types of workload, you can get a clear picture and it begins to form that highlights the areas that are available for improvement around your labor planning. Um, in 2009, Johnson City Medical Center, we found, as Logan stated, uh, when we did this initial analysis, that they were regularly using those contract nurses and also using extensive premium pay uh, to fill open shifts. This next slide here is just an example of the elements that if you're going to do or conduct a workforce analysis that you can, should consider taking a look at. Uh, the first is analyzing those existing core staff resources. Uh, the data should be reported for each individual cost center, but also aggregated at the facility level or if you're a multiple hospital facility at the entire enterprise level. And once again, there's an FTE gap analysis, the right amount of full and part-time FTEs, your contingency staff utilization trends, meaning if we have those additional open shifts, are we having to use those same resources working in overtime or are we having to use external resources to fill those shifts? That's an indication that you might not have the right amount of internal and more flexible forms of contingency resources available to you in a float pool. And then lastly, demand analysis. Do you understand kind of that census mode, that most frequent census point on each unit throughout the year so that you can hire to that level? And also, do you understand any fluctuations uh, in terms of a weekly pattern on that unit or a seasonal pattern through flu season or other areas? Um, what we found is just by doing this analysis, there are really three metrics that um, are low-hanging fruit that can equate to a potential financial savings on each unit, uh, the equivalent of one FTE. So tracking these metrics and, and looking at those in a workforce analysis can be critical in terms of an initial cost savings. The first is FTE leakage. It's a term we use to describe folks that are consistently being scheduled to work below their commitment level. Once again, I'm a point nine, I should be working 36 or 72 hours, but I'm actually being scheduled below that. Those leakage of hours um, are usually being filled by higher or more expensive forms of contingency resources. So 
do we have leakage on each unit or across the enterprise? Also, incidental work time, that's a big opportunity. Are folks actually clocking out and working additional hours beyond what they were scheduled to work within the actual schedule? And so you can analyze that, uh, people's actual worked hours, clocked hours versus their commitment. And then also, imbalanced submitted schedules. Um, Folks are actually building schedules based upon a flatline budget or the manager's doing it on a gut feel or promises made to the actual staff versus aligning those resources against demand. Managing your resources and analyzing in those three buckets can provide a significant savings. Hey, Chris, we got um, a question from Ben Carpinetti out in the uh, audience, and he was curious about um, – what uh, day of the week um, do, do, do do I guess probably Mountain States and then some of your other clients? What day of the week does their pay period end on? Logan, do you want to talk about Mountain States from a pay period perspective, and then I can also elaborate uh, with our clients, other clients. Right. So most of ours end on a, a Saturday and start on on Sundays. So. That, that's also consistent with the majority of our clients. We have a few where Monday is actually the start of a pay period. What we found and what we try to work with, especially in a larger organization with multiple facilities or groups, that one of the things that can be helpful is just trying to make sure you have a consistent pay period start and end date. Sometimes that's not always the case, and that can, that can certainly cause some complications relative to that, how you manage labor and schedule folks. Good question. With that, I just wanted to you know, turn things over in a minute to Logan, but before I do that, um, every organization really needs to understand how best to build an internal contingency resource plan and to layer their float resources. Avanis likes to use the visual, believe it or not, of a, what we call a martini glass. Uh, which is the best way we've seen to describe kind of that funnel effect that occurs when considering the different types of contingency resources. Um, I know when we use the term contingency that that can be seen as a bad thing, kind of carry a negative connotation. However, when used effectively uh, in concert with the other strategies, internal contingency utilization can actually prove to be very financially sound. Um, the graphic describes really the flexibility or, or nimbleness of the different types of internal contingency resources and how broadly they can float. At the bottom of the funnel or glass, you'll see uh, the least flexible pool of resources, uh, your specialized unit-based folks, those highly specialized folks, i.e. for uh, a burn unit, uh, resources that might be flexible in terms of their their FT is the number of hours that they work, but yet are limited in where they float because they have that specialization. The next layer describes the site-based PRN or per diem resources that offer a bit more flexibility in the number of hours they work and when they're available to fill and pick up uh, open shifts. Uh, some can work across multiple departments. These resources don't typically hold an FTE commitment, and you'll only pay for them when you use them, and they're not traditionally a benefit of position. So they can be uh, very uh, useful in terms of uh, picking up an initial set of open shifts. Uh, the facility level, the next layer, are, are full and part-time uh, float resources that can be benefited employees who have the flexibility to float across multiple units, a necessary layer to uh, stabilize the staffing fluctuations at the campus level. Uh, because these folks carry an FTE, the sizing of this group is important, and it must be set at a level that keeps them working to avoid cancellations, just like really your core staff on part-time FTEs. And then that, at the top, you'll notice a very thin final layer of resources, which we call the enterprise flow pool. They're deployed to fill the last-minute gaps in staffing. Their flexibility actually allows them to flow uh, across multiple facilities within a geographic uh, location. And so they uh, are kind of held back and deployed at the last minute against the emerging patient demand. And, and in general, making sure you have a profiled, uh, kind of defined internal contingency resource plan and working with HR and finance and nursing and the other departments to do that uh, can be really critical uh, to 
uh, your, a successful labor management plan. And so with that, I think Logan was going to talk more about the specific actions and some of the outcomes within mountain states. Right, so when MSHA or Mountain States finally uh, began to really focus on labor management in a new way, um, like I said, Johnson City Medical Center was running with, with over 100 plus traveling nurses, uh, external agency, um, around $70,000 a year a person. Uh, and at times that number, as you can see from the graph here, was approaching 140 external travelers. So as you can imagine, this was putting a, a pretty heavy strain on operations uh, at our flagship facility. So we really started a, a comprehensive strategy uh, implementing some of Advantis' tools, uh, more specifically SmartSquare, um, to really assist in the management of that strategy. So as you can see uh, in the next slide, part of Mountain State's strategy was to develop that own internal staffing agency to use within our enterprise. Managing this agency via SmartSquare and a central staffing uh, services office uh, and giving access to managers to the tool, the tool set that they can use to utilize um, the day-to-day -day management and really start to decrease and replace our dependence on external staffing resources and reduce our overall demand to between 20 and 40 uh, internal agency folks. This internal agency staff really allowed for the flexibility we needed at the time and it's still providing that flexibility today, um, albeit as we expand uh, that pool into other areas. So the next slide simply shows uh, as we started our premiums, you know, we were running around $20 an hour for an RN. Um, we've now got that, you know, in fiscal year 11, that moved down to about $8. Today we've moved that down um, even farther into that $5 range from the top level. From a staff's perspective, the methodology behind the utilization of these premiums is really a, a proactive one. The earlier a staff member uh, covers an open shift, and the higher the need that's determined within SmartSquare, the higher that premium. So it's a win for management in the predictability of getting those needs met, and it's really a win-win for the enterprise since our reliance on some of those external uh, agencies is really going down. With that being said, Logan, I think this might be a good time for um, our next polling question, just to get a sense, Brad, of what the audience uh, sees in terms of some of their either challenges or if they have any relative to filling those open shifts. All right, so um, our next question, do you frequently use overtime and or agency as a method to fill your open shifts? We've, we've still got several people who have not uh, weighed in yet, so I'm going to give them another couple of seconds to, uh, to vote. All right, we got about 85% of the folks uh, responded, which is great. Um, and as you can see, it's about uh, two to one uh, for, for organizations that are using uh, over, overtime or, or agencies to help fill those uh, open shifts. We found, Brad, that, that that's actually not uncommon um, across the country. And also, you know, as Logan mentioned, there is hope for folks who are experiencing that right now uh, to get to kind of a better desired future state. And in order to get there, uh, we mentioned the fact that there's some consistent processes and then a tool that kind of automate those processes in order to kind of make improvements in that area. You'll notice on the screen, um, the Vantis has a patented open shift management tool that Mountain States uses. Uh, it's really the purpose is twofold. One is accuracy and posting open shifts and doing that proactively and allowing staff members then to secondly proactively go out there and uh, pick up those open shifts that meet their profile. Um, we found that when incentives are tied to these open shifts uh, and, and you can budget or target a budget for those incentives, um, the highest incentive amounts get tied to the shifts with the greatest percentage of patient need. And so as the employee commits to these shifts and the needs are cured, 
the incentive amounts will decrease uh, to reflect the current needs. Um, it really creates a very proactive way of getting folks to kind of almost compete for shifts and to pick up shifts. The program is customizable and self-administered by uh, the client and in Mountain State's instance by them. And the shifts are automatically posted uh, based upon the unit staffing plans and the forecasted volumes and then uh, based upon the currently submitted course staff schedules. And it, those holes then get posted out there. Managers always have final approval if they'd like, uh, who gets to uh, be deployed or, you know, pick up those particular shifts. And um, once again, those shifts are only available to staff members who meet the criteria for that particular unit. They can also set from a, a Mountain States or manager perspective thresholds. Uh, for example, staff members must first satisfy an FT or weekend commitment before they can see additional open shifts, especially those with incentives attached to them. Okay, the bottom line is it, it, it offers a way to sign up for those extra shifts that is appealing to the staff because they can do so from the comfort of their own homes where they have web access or from work uh, as the schedule gets posted. Uh, the net impact um, across all of our clients is that proactive posting of shifts uh, allows about 70% within Mountain States and other clients uh, within those environments to be picked up more than two weeks in advance of the actual shift. So the whole staffing plan really begins to come into play uh, well in advance of the actual shift and it also helps then to eliminate having to move to those agency over time for people to pick up shifts. So, so Chris, another question uh, that just came in um, has to do with the 32% of the folks that responded that they don't use um, overtime or bonuses. Um, yep. You know, to, to backfill if if they're not doing that, um, you know, would kind of this this methodology uh, benefit them, and and how would you calculate or generate the ROI um, related to that? No, it, it would. That's a great question, Brad. Um, Actually, what we found is, you know, the pendulum recently over the last few years in health, few years in healthcare has kind of uh, swung in another direction where there's not as much, you know, potentially agency or overtime utilization as more people with the economy came back into the workforce. But we found um, there's additional challenges as a result of you know, the hiring of more full and part-time FTEs. In some instances, once again, we find that folks are being benefited and paid to a certain commitment level, but actually not being scheduled to that, that FTE leakage component. We also find that some folks might be slightly overstaffed now um, and that there's a lot of core staff dissatisfaction because in some instances they might be being canceled or might be being floated off of their home unit, which are big dissatisfiers and also provide a, an additional financial opportunity. So in some instances we find organizations where they might not have the right enough full and part-time FTEs hired and are using those other forms of expensive staff and in others we find they actually have too much core staff and they're not being used properly, being canceled, being floated. There's a lot of uh, gaps and they're benefited in worked hours and so there's uh, equal opportunities in those instances too. Good question. Yeah, so with that being said, I think we'll move on to just the second strategy, which really uh, says once you have your workforce right size, you have to make sure that you utilize each type according to their designed role or objective. So one challenge many healthcare organizations struggle with is what we call a siloed approach to labor management meaning a single manager or director concentrates on his or uh, her own department or cost center without much knowledge of what is going on elsewhere within the organization. And that siloed approach to staffing often results with some units sending core staff home, working within their FTE while other similar units within the organization are utilizing over time or bringing in external agency as a last minute source of staff. Um, Hey, For example, Chris? a 300-bed hospital with 20 nursing departments might actually be functioning from a scheduling and staffing perspective as 20 different nursing cost centers or organizations. And so 
many uh, provider organizations think their practices are consistent with their policies, but when you dig a little deeper and you speak to those departments directly, uh, those involved in the daily staffing and scheduling activities, you can begin to uncover some variances or deviations from unit to unit or even shift to shift. So the first step in trying to manage that is a centralized model uh, to create a consistent set of policies and practices uh, to manage those daily activities across the organization. By shifting to that enterprise model of resource management and those consistencies and practice, your organization can really leverage economies of scale, even if you're a single site with multiple units, and benefit from the real-time deployment of flexible contingency resources. Logan outlined uh, some of the cost savings this provided for Mountain States. Um, additionally, managing those resources centrally with the more consistent application of policies promotes objectivity when doing that final placement of resources and it reduced that emotion-based decision-making piece. I'm just really quickly going to show uh, uh, in order to execute. Yeah. Before you go on, um, we've got another question here, um, and, the, and so I'm actually going to uh, – this person's got the audio stuff set up, um, so I'm going to go ahead um, and unmute uh, Shanti and let them ask their question. Perfect. All right, go ahead. Shanti? We can't hear you. Okay, well, if, if you will type that question in uh, to the question box, then I will uh, make sure we get to it um, before the end of today's uh, webinar. Just interrupt me again, Brad, when, when they do that. I just wanted to, uh, real quickly here in a couple minutes, take a quick look at a few screenshots of some of the tools that Mountain States uses to execute on those consistent practices and to support an enterprise approach with the centralized staffing office across their 13 hospitals. Um, as you can see, probably this is the screen of a view across the overall enterprise. Too often staffing is kind of portrayed as a mystery uh, with all the pieces of the puzzle coming together at the last minute. This typically includes decisions that uh, prove to be expensive after the fact without any insight on the impact on productivity. As you can see here, it's important to find a tool that includes a real-time view of resources across the entire enterprise. It's similar to the concept of an air traffic controller who doesn't just focus on a single plane but works to bring in multiple planes to a safe landing and just coordinating that same uh, multiple unit or multiple facility uh, last minute staffing deployment is important through a single view of the enterprise. Without this view, you're kind of left with solving the critical staffing needs on the unit at the last minute. And this screen really, once again, just highlights a clear picture weeks in advance. You can pull this up at, through at Mountain States a couple weeks in advance to try to identify where any potential trouble shifts might be or critical staffing needs might be. This other screen is just a tool that, that basically their central staffing office uses and spends the majority of their time where they can pull up multiple cost centers from multiple facilities side by side to finalize staffing with the on-site clinical leaders, making those last minute float adjustments, recruitment calls and cancellations when necessary. Uh, these tools incorporate uh, the business logic that uh, Logan referenced earlier and that Mountain States has in place. Uh, the process prior used to require tons of paper and a lot of reworking of the numbers, but now everything is automated and they have a completely paperless process within their central staffing office. Uh, the analysis of the staffing for a month, week, or day shifts, uh, day in advance, is really kind of compiled into a very data-driven decision-making process where nursing and other groups can now see more units side by side and make some very uh, single, uh, make some very strategic decisions so that you know, I think I'll just leave this section by emphasizing a single set of eyes through a single kind of group that can deploy last minute resources against demand across the enterprise can really make the entire staffing plan come together. So that's kind of that important second strategy. 
I'll just mention before Logan jumps in again that the, the last kind of set of strategies provides the opportunity for that increased collaboration between nursing operations and finance, focusing on identifying and the development of uh, business intelligence tools that provide that transparency that's needed uh, to better manage labor across the enterprise, you'd probably be surprised, uh, or, or maybe not, that there's a lack of timely data within most organizations relative to this. And so Logan's going to share uh, how they've conquered that challenge within uh, Mountain States. Thanks, Chris. So. Through our implementation of Advantis's um, business intelligent tool sets, uh, finance and clinical leadership have been given a transparent daily view uh, of what's occurring in staffing across uh, any level of the organization. Uh, that could be departments, service lines, facilities, or across the entire enterprises, as Chris had just mentioned. So the first of these tool sets uh, is what's called the financial dashboard. And as you can see here, um, you've got access to a lot of useful information, information that's populated from all of our own Mountain State's payroll and financial data. So there's no question within our own organization about whether or not this information is correct because it's our data and we can audit it. And it really saves a lot of time in conversation that you know both parties, uh, nursing leadership and financial leadership, are on the same page looking at the same information. Um, it's not you know lagged information and it's something we can make action off of. So. The key to that financial dashboard is that it really marries the hours and the dollars into a comprehensive view of, of productivity, again, at any level. So all of the tables and indicators and graphs uh, and budget targets are all clearly identified, meaning that no matter the, the learning style of the manager, let's say, they can understand this information in an easy way. Uh, if they like looking at numbers, those are there. If they like the graphs, those are there. Being able to trend a lot of graphs based on different time intervals allows the managers to see you know, past decisions and how that's affected their numbers and really to increase the knowledge level of that manager. Uh, and it gives finance something to really coach managers to, to say, you know, look, really Monday through Thursday are your really, really busy days and Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you really need to you know, staff down and get underneath those targets to make up some of that time. So this dashboard allows us to do that. Hey, Logan. So by hovering, um, yes, go ahead. Uh, before we go on, uh, we got a, a couple more uh, questions here. Um, one of them asks if the FTEs per adjusted occupied bed um, have decreased since 2009 um, when you guys began this initiative. Uh, it has. I mean, um, you know, I think everybody is kind of seeing, you know, a, a pullback on the inpatient utilization um, as we're moving more towards outpatient. And I think. Um, Healthcare reform is really just going to move us more in that direction. I think that did play into you know some of the benefit we've seen, uh, as I'll get to later in the presentation. Um, and as Chris was alluding to, there's really other um, abilities within the tool that's really allowing us to do some things into the future um, that really is just we just never thought we were going to be able to do before. So, yes, from the the inpatient side, we have seen some decreases in that volume, but you know, a lot of that's moving to outpatient and it's, it's moving into more of the continuum. So, you know, this tool still allows us to go into those areas as well. Great. Thank you. Um, the other one I think is a little bit more specific. And so I think we'll just take care of that question um, outside of this. So great. Thank you. Okay. So on this slide, you can see by, by hovering over a lot of these data points on say the worked hours graph, you can quickly see volume, uh, fixed and variable hours, and the budgeted hours, and really the level of productivity that's achieved at that particular point in time. Uh, just below that, they've got a, a staffing cost graph that shows the, the details of the fixed and variable cost, the budgeted cost, and the, the variance to that cost. So this granular level of information uh, allows for a lot of good conversation and knowledge transfer from finance to and clinical leadership alike. On the uh, next slide, you can see in the, the lower left-hand corner uh, is the uh, hourly staffing cost table. Uh, this table displays in a quick breakdown what makes up your average hourly rate. So unlike having the, the high-level financial statement for the department that might have a cumulative hour, average hourly rate, this table can you know, really break it down by skill and shows the financial impacts of things like source mix and premiums and shift differentials and, and really the utilization of overtime on what that core staffing rate really is. So I think, did we have another question, a poll question here, Brad? Yep, we have got one more. Let me launch that here. 
Right. Um, and so, um, do you have access to real time or next day productivity metrics uh, within your organization? We got about half the people have uh, have answered so far, so let's give it give it a little bit more. Uh, you know, I'm kind of I'm definitely interested to see in this, and I also wonder, you know, kind of what uh, what is the depth, you know, or robustness of a lot of the the data that's available, because I know that's something I'm always working on. So so once again, the ratios are kind of uh, kind of similar from uh, from one question to the next. Um, we have got about a two to one ratio um, here of folks who are saying that they do have um, access to this, to real time or next day productivity metrics within their organization. Great, I, th I think that's really interesting findings. Um, I don't know that you see um, that much access to a lot of, of next day productivity out there, but that's that's good that folks are looking at it that much. And I wonder how easy it is to get to because I know we can we can get to it, but you got to go into like the time clock system. Right, exactly, and and I think that's and I can I'll speak a little bit more to that here as we go on to on what we really see is as some of the work we're starting to get into in the future and and how that's you know just having next day is one thing, but really being able to be proactive is is a whole next step. So the um, second major tool that, that Mountain States utilizes is, is what's called the Variance Dashboard. The Variance Dashboard provides managers with the tools to quickly audit um, any exceptions between the time clock and our payroll system and the Let shift schedule. We, we got Sorry. a question that I think probably is going to dovetail into what you're about to, to, to talk about Great. here. Um, Great. Great. This comes from uh, Michael Lust, and he wanted to know, you know, he stated that, that his organization's challenged in getting uh, daily time edits and charge entries um, for many of the departments in. Um, and if you have any suggestions or anything that have worked within Mountain States to kind of help drive that culture change of getting those in timely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, that's actually something I was going to mention, mention a little bit in our, our future state of what we're doing. You know, we were you know, originally structuring, uh, struggling with the same thing. You know, this tool provided a lot of, of transparency, which I'll talk about. Um, but what we've really gone to at the next level of Mountain States is really uh, taking this tool and taking some lean concepts of what's called standard work and one piece flow and really uh, sit down and essentially create a recipe for the nurse managers and the other, um, you know, ancillary managers that is really the step-by-step, -step, call it a, a Betty Crocker cake recipe of what they're supposed to do on a daily basis to really make sure that the things you're talking about uh, as far as the small stuff that falls through the cracks that can lead to, to big data problems, um, to really make sure that those things don't happen. And the key to that, that whole concept and that whole lean concept is that there's also a level of accountability built into that uh, from a leadership perspective that the standard work that's developed within the lean methodology is really uh, we actually take those at mountain states and put those in our policies and procedures and the standard works um, are built around the tool they're built around the concepts they're built around the policies and procedures from hr so it's just another policy and procedure but it's also a step-by-step -step recipe on how to actually uh, do the policy and procedure so it really uh, has given us a, a great um, call it a, a dovetailed tool set um, that we internally use on top of this tool. So that's really helped us to, to crack down, so to speak, on, on what you're exactly talking about that, that you're having problems with. So, you know, on this screen here with the variance dashboard, um, the manager is able to do daily maintenance of um, the information that's fed into this. So there's no, there's no waiting around for weekly and biweekly or monthly productivity. On the, the next slide, you can see by hovering over some of the markers on the variance detail graph, a manager can identify those large variances in time or cost. And then um, by clicking on that actual marker, you can see the detail of that variance by employee. So this detail can lead to opportunities to coach those employees on better managing their incidental work time or um, 
essentially can also lead to uh, opportunities where staff are not working exactly to the schedule that they're supposed to and so on and so forth. So as Chris mentioned, this is the, the granular view into the payroll system across that entire um, cost center or entity that really shows where you have some of those gaps. And, and some of the larger gaps may be logical. Um, you know, somebody worked outside of a shift and there might be a, a logical reason. Some of these um, where you're looking at a, a very small 0.25 or a 0.5, that may be some, some instance where the same employee is just not clocking out in a timely manner. Um, I know, for instance, at, at um, you know, in some of my prior work when I was a, an interim CFO within our system, we had a lot of this incidental clocking time showing up. And, and as I worked with our uh, staffing folks to really dig into why that was occurring, we found that when we had actually installed our uh, clocking system, and we use a, a Kronos as our payroll system, we only put one clock for all the nurses to use, and it was on the first floor. So we had nurses going to the second, third, fourth, and fifth floor, and because our, our old hospital was a little bit older that I was in, a lot of those elevators were slower, and they were also used by patients and staff alike. So the staff was having to clock in on the first floor, and then maybe having to let, you know, um, some family members or something for one of our patients get a get on the elevator ahead of them and it was essentially making them late so we figured out you know hey we could spend three thousand bucks and put a couple more clocks in on the different levels of the facility and really got rid of twenty five thousand dollars a year in just incidental clocking time so it's that kind of detail that you can really whittle away at some of those dollars and cents so just in kind of a review here um, by standardizing schedules and policies in the first year at Mountain States, you know, we, we got a quick $3 million in savings. Um, by adding to that and developing our own internal agency pool of team members, um, we were now then saving upwards of $12 million uh, for the entire year. The utilization of the variance dashboard and managing that incidental uh, clocking time of team members was saving us, you know, now four to $500,000 a year of, of problem we essentially had before that we're now able to, to get reports and to see that information much easier. And all of this time really adds up into savings. Um, as we, you know, look towards the move from inpatient to outpatient, we're starting to expand into ancillary and really looking at the possibilities, as Chris was saying, with large uh, physician clinics like our hospitalist group. And we're actually starting to get into more um, overhead departments like our revenue cycle, where we've got 200 plus team members that you know, really kind of work to a variable statistic, and that's the number of bills that we have going out the door or the amount of rework that they may have to do. So it's really something that becomes um, cross-functional across lots of different areas. So other outcomes uh, of our success um, has been the integration of that internal staffing agency into our other hospitals, uh, increasing in a lot of nursing satisfaction with regards to being able to predict and get their needs filled. Uh, without having to, to run around and make phone calls to, to try to find people at the last minute. And there's just been more automation and transparency of the entire, you know, payroll and staffing uh, and system uh, combined. So other, you know, productivity and, and variance related issues are, are more timely identified uh, with more actionable data down to the team member level. Um, leading leadership and finance to really be able to coach managers on, on what specifically they need to try to improve. And lastly, you know, one of the outcomes that, that's just emerging at, at Mountain States, and this is kind of a, a piggyback on what we talked about from the question, is that we're really starting to utilize this tool with our lean work, and, and not just the concepts of lean with regards to creating standards and accountability with how to use this tool or how to staff, but as we start to, to do our lean work in clinical areas, we're very slowly, you know, chipping away at 30 and 45 minutes worth of, of time in a clinical process that essentially is unnecessary and wasted time. And we're able to then go into the system and update the staffing plans to really just, you know, not necessarily take out an entire shift from uh, a given department, um, but take, for instance, in our emergency departments where you can trim off 30, 45 minutes of shift, you know, sending people home an hour early, um, but then also now scheduling them because they don't have work to do, because our lean systems are starting to clean up that waste. And this system's really enabled us to allow that kind of opportunity to hit the bottom line. Whereas before, you know, as Chris had mentioned, it'd be on paper and, you know, maybe after a couple months they would realize they needed to change the staffing plan because they could see people sitting around. 
we're really able to, to hit that bottom line so much faster because of the knowledge that we have now and because of the tool set that we have. So that's just a, another added outcome that, you know, as healthcare you know, reform continues and as we continue as, a, as an industry to try to get better and, and things move more to the outpatient setting, you know, this tool helps us, you know, transition into those areas and really um, brings that level of, you know, staffing to demand versus staffing to capacity uh, into play and, and really just assists us with lots of other uh, lots of other possibilities out there. Logan, you mentioned uh, reform a minute ago, and uh, so I've got a question that goes right along with that. Um, this is from Stan Hunt, and he wanted to know, how are you preparing uh, for the ACA impact and adjusting um, your metrics for the 30-hour rule for full-time status? Right. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, you've got um, – uh, we've got a couple of different groups at Mountain States from a from an HR perspective that really get involved uh, pretty heavily with that, and you know they take that into account and they take into account um, you know what we're doing with PRNs and and really it's the same group that does our premiums, um, so they really handle a lot of that. Uh, I'm not sure specifically how they're how we're going to really incorporate some of that. Chris, I don't know if on your side you have any thoughts about you know what other clients may be doing there. You know, I think what we found just recently is that I think we have another year now to try to figure figure out that 30-hour rule and how to handle that. But relative to that, it, it really gets down to, if you remember that kind of my, martini glass or the funnel, um, there's multiple types of staff and our internal contingency resources that are important and all would have uh, different levels of commitments that could put them in a benefited position. It, it's really about building out and collaborating with HR and finance and operations to try to figure out uh, how many PRN per diem folks might be needed, uh, how many float pool resources that might have that FT commitment level that would put them over 30 hours or the enterprise float pool. So it's, it's really customized by facility and really on, all the way down to the cost center everything from the demographics of that particular department to the volumes and fluctuations and volumes or census that might occur on that particular unit. Um, so we have some time to try to figure that out, but it, it really harkens back to that, that funnel and the fact that you need layers of different types of resources available to you based upon what's actually happening on that unit. With that being said, I think I'll just wrap up and, uh, with the time, you know, bumping up against that time. Logan does a great job of, of telling the exciting story uh, at Mountain States, and so I certainly appreciate uh, him doing that. What we found in our work across the country with organizations like them is that there's really, once again, three core strategies that if you deploy one or all of them, you're going to find that it's absolutely a proven way to better manage labor and to produce significant cost and time savings. The first is just right-sizing that core staff levels, your full and part-time FTEs, as well as then understanding the right amount of types of intern, internal contingency resources you need. The second is um, moving to a centralized approach with consistent practices and policies across the organization and a way through a single set of eyes to deploy those last minute resources to the right place and to share resources when possible. And then the third is just the rigor and the tools available to measure outcomes in both hours and costs on a daily basis, allowing managers to take that meaningful action to get back on plan, uh, not on a uh, per pay period or a monthly basis, but on a daily basis. And through you know, the optimization and effective utilization of staff, um, you know, and through these three strategies, hospitals and healthcare systems can curb that waste both in cost and time and that redu redundancy that's kind of become part of a, a long accepted practice uh, and, and kind of the status quo. So hopefully these strategies are helpful to you today. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, so I want to take a minute here, uh, open it up, let people, uh, if you've got a question um, and you've got, you know, audio set up um, on your computer so your mic works or um, you're connected through your phone, uh, feel free to go ahead and raise your hand um, and I can unmute you. Or if you want to type, uh, 
type of question into the, the question box there, we can uh, definitely uh, get to it that way as well. Um, while I'm kind of waiting to see if we've got any questions, um, I want to go ahead. Uh, Kara, if you can go ahead and flip to the, the last slide for me. Um, so we've got uh, a lot of new upcoming events. Um, you know, this, this is our new uh, monthly webinar series. Uh, Tennessee trains on Tuesday. Uh, we did it on Friday this week, just because that, that was the only time that everybody's schedules kind of um, jived up. So I don't have a topic yet for our August one, but I know um, our speaker is going to be Kathy Doherty um, from Gwinnett Medical Center um, down in Georgia. Um, September, we're going to have a, a reimbursement webinar. Uh, October, we're still working on lining up our next uh, speaker. And then um, in November, we're going to have a, a webinar on ACA uh, eligibility. We've got some other live events uh, coming up as well. Um, in September, we're going to be doing our Cahaba Roadshow again. Um, and I believe that's going back to all five uh, cities we did last year, uh, which would be uh, Johnson City, Tri-Cities, uh, Knoxville, Chattanooga, Nashville, and Memphis. And then we're going to have the Fall Institute in Gatlinburg, uh, October 23rd through 25th. Um, and then we've got a couple other um, events uh, coming up as well that happen every year with uh, the Tri-State Institute and the Dixie Institute. And Dixie Institute, I believe, is in Gulf Shores uh, this year. So that'll be a pretty good one to uh, to get to go to to catch a little beach time um, in February. So we do not have uh, any questions. So uh, go ahead and, and wrap it up. Thank you. Uh, Chris and Logan for uh, taking the time and uh, helping us out with this webinar today. We really appreciate it. Um, and this was some great information. I know this is definitely something uh, that has been a topic here at Vanderbilt Medical Center um, where I'm at um, that we're, we're really starting to take a deeper look at and work on. Great. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. All right. So um, hopefully everybody who's still on here, you should get an email with um, a survey link. Um, if you can go ahead and click that, it's like a three question survey. Um, just gives us feedback evaluation on the program and take a couple minutes uh, to fill that out. So you'll probably get that in email some point later this afternoon. Um, if for some reason you don't get it, um, shoot an email to webinars at uh, tnhfma.org and uh, we can send you that link. So thank you, gentlemen.